Hi, my name is Nick and I'm a student at Swansea University and today I'm going to be walking you through a brief demonstration of how to use persistence images to do a simple machine learning classification task. Now, if you're not familiar with persistent homology or persistent images, I'd recommend you go take a look at some of the other fantastic videos on this channel. In particular, I know that Rachel Neville has put together a video on persistence images and that might be a good starting point. I'm going to be walking you through some code uh, which I've written in Python and in particular I'm using the Giotto TDA library to do the persistence calculations and the scikit-learn library to do the machine learning and you can find links to these here. You'll also find a link to a copy of this notebook with some annotations if you prefer to look at that. But let's get started. So we're actually going to be looking at some MNIST data today. So these are hand-drawn digits um, sort of a classic data set. And in particular, we're going to try and classify zeros from eights based on the holes in them. So some examples of the kind of data we're looking at are these. So we've got some zeros on the left-hand side and some eights on the right-hand side. And we see that the hole in the zero is pretty pronounced. So it's going to be fairly easy to detect. The hole in the eights can be fairly sort of clear, as in the top right example, but they can also be a bit... Um, a bit unclear as in this bottom right example we see the bottom hole um, due to the thickness of the pencil has been filled in a little bit. Now we could just apply persistent homology to these directly um, but in that case we won't be able to tell the difference between the different holes um, and that'll be a problem. So we're going to chuck in some sort of location information in there just by multiplying the images by their or multiplying the pixels by their difference in height um, from the from the top edge. So in particular we're going to be multiplying by an image that looks like this. And if we take a look at what that looks like, we get this. And so we see now if we have a filtration where we put in the dark pixels first and fill in the lighter pixels later and finishing off with the white pixels, then for the zero we're going to spot the hole when we fill in these light grey pixels and that persistence class will die as we fill in the, uh, the white pixels. For the eight, we see for the bottom hole, that'll be born quite early as we fill in these dark gray pixels and persist all the way until we fill in the white pixels. And the top hole will be similar to the, the hole in the zero in that we will fill it in when we get to these light gray pixels and it will die when we hit the white pixel. And we see the problems that the, uh, the noisiness is gonna cause for this bottom right eight we see that this uh, bottom hole is going to appear around the same time, but it's going to die much earlier because this is gray in the middle and not white. But let's see if that bears out. So we're going to compute persistent homology now using Giotto, but we're actually going to use a, uh, a function from Goody, which is another persistence calculation library to do the plotting, uh, since it just works a little bit better with the uh, matplotlib, which I'm using to do my plots. And we see indeed that uh, there is one, one class in the H1 diagram for uh, the zeros that's born quite late and dies right at the end. And for the eights, we see two holes, uh, one that's born quite early and dies at the end and the other that's born late and dies at the end. And for this noisy eight, we see in fact, yes, one of these holes dies a lot earlier than it sort of should do. But now we're going to turn these into persistence images. Uh, so 15 by 15, and just using a sigma equal one. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to look at the average persistence images for the zeros and the average for the eights. And this, what do we get? So we see for the zeros, there's this sort of one cluster. And so we expect to see one point in the persistence diagram um, appearing somewhere within this cluster. And for the eights, we get these two clusters, uh, one for each hole. So one is in a similar place as for the zeros. So that's the top hole. And then one up here, and that'll be the bottom hole. And notice how sort of smudged this cluster is. This corresponds to the fact that it's the bottom hole that's often less well-defined, as in that example we looked, up, uh, looked at up there. Okay, so we're in a place to do some machine learning now. So let's try some some classical models. Uh, let's try, for example, a sport vector machine. 
So first off, we're going to split our data into a training set and a test set, so we can see how well the models do. And then we'll try the support vector machine. And remember, this tries to find the maximum separating hyperplane between your data. So picture the points on this side as being the zeros and the points on this side as being the eights projected down onto two dimensions. And then this is going to try and find the line which separates them. So let's give it a go. Uh, we're going to check that in with a standard scalar that's just going to make sure that our data is centered. So it has zero mean and a standard deviation of one. And let's see how it does. Oh, 95%. That's pretty good. Um, so it seems to be able to determine the eights and zeros pretty well in 95% of cases. And something we can do is we can take a look at the coefficients to try and figure out what's going on. Um, and so I've plotted them here. Uh, I don't know about you, but I can't tell what's going on here at all. Um, not sort of the easiest to interpret. But with that in mind, let's try a different model then uh, that will perhaps lead to more interpretable results. And what's nice about persistence images being a vector is that we can use, use models, uh, generalized linear models like logistic regression. You see, for the support vector machine, all we needed was a notion of, sort of distance between our persistence diagrams. Uh, and we could have used the bottleneck distance or the Wasserstein or slice Wasserstein for that. But for some of these other models, we literally need a vector to plug in. Um, so for example, for logistic regression, and that's where the persistence images come in useful. Uh, now recall logistic regression, it's a generalized linear model. Uh, and the idea is we're going to take some linear um, linear combination of the input. And then if that's very negative, we're going to give it a score of zero. And if that's very positive, we're going to give a score of one. And we're going to use that to try and classify into two cases. So it's called logistic regression, but it's really a classifier. And then in this in-between case, we sort of smoothly interpolate between the two using this sigmoid function. And then training it, we're going to try and minimize the number of, we'll find out the weights, the linear combination that minimize the number of incorrect classifications, along with some regularization, uh, we're going to try and minimize the sort of some of the squares of the weights and see how that does. And it's not quite as good, 84% accuracy. But now look at the, uh, the coefficients that it learns. And we can immediately spot some of the features we saw in the average persistence images. So in particular, this dark blue says, look, uh, components appearing here uh, are indicative of being an, a zero. And the yellow says, this is where the eights come in. So if we take a look at the average persistence images, we see yeah, the dark blue corresponds to this cluster here, telling the zeros. And the yellow corresponds to this cluster up here, telling the eights. But you notice there could be a chance for a bit of confusion, uh, since there should be a point for the eights down here as well, which will get picked up in this, this dark blue. And we can actually verify that if we look at the confusion matrix. So this says, um, you know, for each of our test data, where did it end up being classified? Um, so we see for the, the zeros, they were all correctly classified as being a zero. So for the eights, quite a lot of them actually were misclassified as a zero. Um, and we can see that because of that, that point for the eight appearing in this blue area here. So this kind of picture is great. It shows us sort of which are the most important parts of our persistence image that are driving the classification. But we can take that a little bit further if we only want to sort of pick out one or two components that are sort of most important. And that's if we use L1 regularization with our logistic regression. So in this case, we're going to try and minimize the number of incorrect classifications as well as the sum of the absolute values of the weights this time. And just by the sort of geometry of this absolute value, it means a lot of components will get set to zero. And so we'll sort of pull out the most interesting ones. And if we do, we get one component for the, the zeros and one for the eights, uh, nicely sort of simplifying this picture here. Not quite as accurate though. 
so that's most of what I wanted to show you. I thought it'd be interesting at the end just to try this out on all the different digits, not through nine. Now, I'm not expecting this to do very well um, at all, but it might be interesting to see. So let's give that a go. Let's grab our digits, do our persistence transformations. Let's take a look at the average persistence images. Yeah, and we see that a lot of these are gonna look very similar. So say, so look at the twos and the threes. The persistence images end up looking almost exactly the same. And so if we try out uh, our classifier again, the uh, support vector machine, and look at the confusion matrix, yeah, yeah. So we notice that the zeros do pretty well for themselves, uh, as do the sixes, the eights, and the nines. So all the digits with holes in them. But everything else, it sort of mis misclassifies them as a one. So the one, the two, the four, uh, the three, the five, the seven, they all, they're all digits without a hole. The persistence just sees it as a shape with no holes in it. It goes, yes, that's a one. So that's pretty interesting. Also here we see uh, a bit of confusion between sixes and eights. And you could see how just during sort of drawing an extra flick in your six could easily turn it into an eight or just hastily drawing your eight could lead it to being a six. And we see that reflected in the confusion matrix here. So that's pretty interesting. But in any case, I hope that's been sort of a, a very simple demonstration of how you can apply persistent images to do a classification task uh, and the kind of tools that are available to you. Thank you very much.